project. Good morning, good morning. So today we are doing this little sampler and it's such a cute project. And um, what I loved about this project is it gives you the chance to experience a couple of different things that you maybe have not thought about like chenille, fringe, decorative stitches, piecing in the hoop, red work. I mean, applique most of us have done. Um, but with the other thing I loved about this is I did my little guide this way according to the directions exactly. Now, if you've done classes with me before, you know that when these tiny letters come up, I don't use 40 weight thread like I normally do. So today I'm going to show you the difference. Here's my 40 weight thread. And I'll zoom in in a minute when I get it out. There we go. And then here today, I'm going to be using this 80 weight decabob. Yes, decabob is great for sewing your piecing together, but it's also great for embroidering on small letters. So let me zoom you in there so you can see this. All right, so there's my 40 weight and right next to it is my 80 weight. Can you see the difference in how thin that thread is? So what I'm gonna do is a quicker, quick switcheroo. When we do the dark gray, which is gonna be this embroidery up here and then all of our letters. She's can't she sit on at all. Okay, so um, just it. pass it on to Lori. I can't, I'm in oh, the middle of class. Good. I sent it out twice. So um, when we get to the to stitching like this and look at on this, can you see how I'm seeing some bobbin thread come through? Can you see how my letters are a little muddy? I won't have that with the 80 weight. I won't have it with 60 weight, but we didn't have 60 weight in gray. So I grabbed Decabob, which is 80 weight, a little bit finer even. I'll do the switcheroo. I'm gonna go ahead and do the regular traditional lettering up here with the 40 weight when it makes that cut up here for the 40 weight, then I'm gonna go ahead and change out my um, my thread to the 80 weight. And since this is 80 weight, I'm gonna change out my bobbin too because my bobbin, my embroidery bobbin is the 60 weight. So my embroidery bobbin is gonna be heavier than my top thread. So I just have a bobbin of the 80 weight. Um, and I'll do that little switcheroo for that so that you can see the difference. I just love lettering, I love fonts. I love words. I love, you know, uh, things that have little phrases and stuff on them. So I do a lot of leather lettering and I just find that I like it so much better when it's not muddy. And maybe you will too. All right. So we're still struggling. I don't, I have no idea what happened this morning. I sent um, the reminder out last night. I sent it out this morning early. I sent it out again five minutes ago before we started. I have no idea what happened. So um, hopefully Lori can figure it out. All right, because we're going forward. So your kit, if you got your kit from A1, you have everything that you need. Um, you can see I'm using an eight by eight hoop only because I have one here. Uh, the directions call for an eight by 12 hoop. Um, if you have an eight by 12, that's fine too. I just have the eight by eight and my, I like to do my embroidery in the smallest hoop I can use for that specific project. And since we had one, um, that's what I'm going to use. We have a cutaway, um, stabilizer as per the directions. You have some topper that's, um, going to be used. I forget what the topper is going to be used for either the red work or, um, yeah, I think maybe the red work. Don't remember. Uh, this is wash away topper. And then you have your pieces of fabric that are pre-cut for you. Um, and they also need to be backed. So if you look at some of them, like that, this is for our butterfly that needs to be backed. Um, the rest of these are okay. And then our center needs to have its backing applied. So I've got my iron warming up. And then I'm going to set these aside for now. And I'm going to grab my directions. Also, when I did my um, embroidery, I have a chenille cutter. So if you're not familiar with the chenille cutter, 
a chenille is it's a I think it's either a clover or an olfa. I think it might be an olfa, but it's like a little square, and each square has a little piece of plastic that fits between the rows of stitching. And there's four different sizes, so it depends on how much space is between each row of stitching for the chenille. And then there's a little um, there's a little rotary blade in there, so you literally just put the piece of plastic through and pull it through to the other side and it's it slits all of the the um, patterns for the chenilling and then i have a wire chenille brush as well to kind of brush it up today because some of you may not have that i'm just going to be using a regular uh seam ripper but the nice thing about it is it has this rubber tip so when you want to actually fluff your chenille this rubber will do the job for you and then um, you should have a bobbin with vanish or some other type of dissolving thread for the fringe. So you got to experience a couple other things. So if you really wanted to be picky, I was thinking about this this morning and then I thought, no, I don't want to be that picky. I was working on a piecing project yesterday at the store and I do piece with deco bob because it's so fine that it doesn't matter how many how many angles you have that you're joining together. The thread is so fine that it doesn't leave a lot of weight behind. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could get cleaner presses with this uh, piecing if I actually use the deco bob. But I thought, well, that might be getting a little bit too OCD. So I'm just going to use the regular 40 weight um, thread for this, for the piecing. But I am going to use my, um, my clapper, which is a wooden um, pressing block that allows you to get a nice crisp seam. I have a small one here somewhere too. It's my favorite one for in the hoop. Let's see if I can find it. Where are you, darling? Oh, here we go. The smaller size one I'll be using. Just to give myself a little bit, because we're doing a lot of flipping and folding here. And it's just, I think, um, if we just give everything a good press and get a nice flat surface on there, it's going to be much easier to finish it off nicely. Um, and that's it. That's it. This is just fun. It's a fun one. I allowed a little bit more time on this one, um, which I sent out last night. So you may not have gotten it. Um, I don't know what happened. The internet ate it, I guess. But um, I allowed a little bit more time because we have a lot of stitching here. And um, especially with the piecing, these are a lot of little tiny pieces that you have to flip, fold, press, and trim. So it takes a little bit more time. All right, so uh, you're gonna need a white bobbin for uh, your uh, embroidery bobbin. And um, you're gonna need some paper tape or transport tape. I have my directions printed out. And uh, I will be going through them. Now, they have this set up so that you can do it in the five by seven hoop or the eight by 12 hoop. We are using the eight by 12 hoop, which means that when we flip to the back where it says eight by 12 hoop, we don't get any of the pictures. We get just a few pictures. So I'm going to be flipping back and forth um, from the five by seven because the five by seven one actually brings in close-up views of some of the stuff that we're going to be doing, like the piecing and, and that sort of thing. So I'll be bouncing back and forth between the, the two. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and bring my pressing stuff over here so that I can go ahead and press and get my backing on me. I always like to add a little bit of best press to all of the pieces because I think it makes everything just kind of a little bit nicer to work with when it's got a nice finish on it. So I'm just gonna do a little bit here. This by, by far, <clears throat> excuse me, this by far is one of my favorite irons. You know why? Because I can actually use it to press in the hoop. It fits in the hoop because if it's kind of like elliptical shape here. It's a little cat eye. I call it the cat eye iron. But uh, it fits in the hoop. So I love that because when it comes to pressing that, that 
those pieces that are part of the uh, piecing little part of the sampler, it's going to be much easier to get a nice smooth press with that. Okay, that one's ready. When you put backing on, you're not ironing. It's not a, mm -mm. it's a hold the iron in one place, count to 10 and then move to another place. Lift it up and move it. What you're trying, what you're wanting to do is melt the glue, not iron the wrinkles out. For those of you that have heat presses at home, I do all of mine with a heat press. I just line all of the um, all of the pieces up on the platen that'll fit. I have a 15 by 15. Line them all up, and just mine is a push button up down. It goes up down by itself. I just set the temperature, and then I just set the timing for 10 seconds, and the um, the heat press does the rest of it. So heat press works for more than just heat transfer, vinyl sublimation, and that sort of thing. It's actually an easy surface too, because it's big. It lets me get a lot a lot of pieces done all at one time. All right, so now that I've got the stick done, I can kind of do the iron over it from the front. But I know that that's stuck because holding the iron in one place melts the glue. And that's the object when you're putting backing on, is melting the glue. All right, let's bring those over. All right, I'm gonna see if I can do both of these at one time. All right, those are ready, I'll set them aside. I'm gonna grab my other pieces here and just give them some best press. Yeah, it's a great story. All right, all done. If I'm going through that right now, I know. Why do they do it and recycle everything? All right, I'm going to set everything aside, get this out of the way for now. And if you are just joining us, we're glad you found us. Don't know why you got lost, but um, I am using an eight by eight hoop. If you have one and you want to use that, that's fine. If not, the directions call for an eight by 12. So I am going to go have you go ahead and hoop your stabilizer and we're going to jump over to the machine. <laughs> and me too. coffee and all. All right, I'm gonna just kind of mask me so that you can just see the machine. All righty. I'm on the Luminera this morning. All 
All right. So I'm just going to pull up my design. So if you're accessing it from your um, USB, you want to access the one that says embroidery hoop stitch sampler. And then mine, I, I think, just has the uh, PES file in here. If you have a different machine, you'll have a diff all your files in there. And then I'm not doing the piece diversion, although I have to tell you, Kimberbell's piecing is really quite simple if you have a smaller hoop. Um, but it's always nice when you don't have to piece. So I'm going to go ahead and select the 8 by 12 and then set. All right. And so I'm going to refer. Uh, you can see there's a lot of the same colors kind of going on here. If you're not, if you're new-ish to embroidery, um, the machine's not going to stop for like to flip and fold or to do a placement line and a tack down for an applique unless it has a reason to stop. And so adding multiple colors to a design gives the machine a reason to stop so that you can actually perform the duties that you need to do. So I'm going to start by selecting embroidery and let's see what our first stitch out is. So I'm going to grab my directions here. I'm pretty sure I know what it is, but. And I'm again, if you're just joining us, I'm going to bounce back and forth between the five by seven and the eight by 12 because the directions for the eight by 12 don't have all the pretty pictures. So um, if you are looking at the eight by 12, our step one is iron fusible backing. We already did that. Step two is to stitch the background placement line onto the stabilizer. So there's my, my, so I get like, one and a half pages of directions for an eight by 12 and I get like 17 for the rest. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and put my hoop on. I have right now, I just have white embroidery bobbin thread in. I'm starting embroidery this morning with a new needle. Um, and I have been loving the, the, um, the 80 Microtex Chrome needles that the boys put in when they service the machines. I've been loving those unless I'm using um, fusible. If I'm, I mean like sticky stabilizer. If I'm using sticky stabilizer, then I'm usually gonna go ahead and go with um, a seven, uh, 7511 anti-glue. All right, I'm just gonna put in a neutral color. It's just gonna be my placement. And I'm going to sew that placement line. I'm going to try to get you guys kind of a decent angle here so I don't have to keep popping the camera around. All right, since I'm not placing or I'm not piecing for the five by seven, um, I just have one line, which is a circle for my tack down line. So I'm going to place this over and I kind of like to start by folding and then I'll start using like the center marking of the hoop here and there, because that way when I open it up, I know I have equal amount of fabric all the way around. And to double check, you can always fold it in the other direction and see that you have equal amount of space here and here. And if you are so inclined, you can tape it. I think I can hold mine in place. Let's see, let's see what the tiny bits of directions that we have for the eight by 12 say. Yep, stitch the background basting line, but do not um, do not uh, cut the circle yet. Tape if you wish. I'm going to live dangerously. I'm just going to hold it. And hopefully not hurt myself, right, with the needle. All right. Looking at my screen, it looks like butterfly wings. So I'm going to grab, and I can we can use this as well as a cue because it's already done. So my butterfly wings, 
are going to be these two fabrics, the dark blue and the light blue. So I'm just going to grab those. Those are the ones that we actually put the backing on. So here's the top of the butterfly wings and here's the bottom. So I am doing, it looks like the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and change my thread out to a darker blue. Not this one. <laughs> Sorry. Just grabbing some dark. I wish I had something that was more navy but I don't really. This is about as navy as it gets. All right, I just turned the speed down on my machine a little bit so that the people that are trickling in have a chance to catch up. So if you're just joining us, welcome. Sorry about that, have no idea what happened. Sent the link out last night and twice this morning. <laughs> Even checked it to make sure that I didn't send you the wrong link because I have done that in the past. Not always, not frequently, but sometimes. All right, so. Stitch the lower butterfly wings placement line. That's what I'm doing. All right, so now we're gonna place our fabric. Please note that this fabric is directional. So um, you would wanna place it, you know, Make sure when you place it, you place it kind of straight. Let's see if I fold it in half. Pull it down just a little bit more. And again, you can tape. In this case, um, I'm going to just hold it because it's a small piece. But when pieces are this small, I tend to not spray base them because it's really hard to do that without over spraying onto some place where you're going to get sticky. That, you know, if you spray the whole back of the piece of fabric, then um, it's going to get sticky on where you're going to trim. So tape it or hang on to it. So now we're going to trim the fabric close to the stitching line. I think I might be able to do this here. Let's see. So I have a whole stack of scissors here. Usually these are my favorite. These are the little double curve femores. And they're really sharp all the way to the tip, which is something I really like. So trimming is not something that I really do very quickly because if I try to do it fast, I always end up not getting it as nice as I would like it. So I kind of tend to take my time with the trimming part, especially if you've got backing on there because let's face it, it's a little bit harder to trim when it's got the, the stabilizer backing, this SF-101 on it. So we're only doing one applique, so I'm I'm going to try to make it through this without taking it over to the table.
right. Let me grab some tape so I can get all those little stray ends of fabric off. So it's going to go ahead and do the satin stitch next. So I'm going to continue to use this blue. So I'm just going to press go. <clears throat> if you are just joining us, I have my machine set down a little bit slower so that um, you can possibly catch up if you would like to. I'll give you the brief synopsis. Um, you have fabric inside your packet that requires um, SF-101 be applied to the back. Do that first. I like to give everything a little quick press before I stitch on it. So if you're so inclined, you can do that. Hoop your stabilizer. Your stabilizer in your kit's been cut for an eight by 12 hoop. Um, I'm using an eight by eight. And then you're going to begin by um, running the first color stock, which is a placement line for this, your backing. And the second one is a tack down for your backing fabric, your background fabric. Do not trim your background fabric. And then the next thing to stitch is your butterfly. All right, getting in the groove. Okay, so the next thing to stitch is the applique piece for the top of the wings. So that one is the other piece of fabric that you backed, which is this one. So I'm gonna change to a color that's more complementary to that.
And again, I think I'm just going to hold this down. I also noted no, noticed when I was doing the sample that they actually did send you some SVG files for this project. So if you're so inclined, you can always, you know, cut the pieces out ahead of time on your skin and cut. Or Cricut, if that's what you have. All right. So we are, if you are following along with your directions on page 15 uh, for your eight by 10, we are actually on step number seven, which is, no, we're on step number eight which is the um, butterfly satin outline. And this is wild, because after this, you would think that you were gonna be stitching the butterfly's body, but not. You're gonna be, you're gonna be doing your, um, your quilting, your little piecing down here. It's wild. All right. 
So you take a look at what's showing in the sewing screen, and that is the um, that is the piece block template. So um, I'm going to use a lighter color than what I was using for the the piecing, and it's going to be more of like a peach pink color. It's just kind of I think going to disappear into both colors. So. That's what I'm going to be using. It'll be dark enough that I can see the line, light enough that um, it won't matter uh, when it's put together. You won't see it. But use what you can see if that, you know, if you struggle with this. All right, I'm going to take this over to um, to the table because I want to show you using the larger direction. So give me a minute to move the camera. All right, so we have these different uh, these different sections here. And we're actually starting at the bottom. So I'm going to refer to the directions from the uh, five by seven which uh, shows it a little bit better that your that section one is the bottom so we're starting at the bottom so one of the things that i have to be careful your pieces are really big but remember that your pieces could be flipping and folding from any direction so when you put the piece on there um, make sure you don't like short sheet it on one side or the other because if it's on an angle and you go to fold it up you're going to have a hole so make sure that you just place them e equally. So um, let's see what we got. This is gonna be my first piece. And it's going to be right side up. And I'm gonna leave a little bit there. I'm gonna leave equal amount on either side. Doesn't really matter on the bottom. And then um, I'm gonna take that down. I'm gonna stitch the piece two trimming placement line. Oh, piece two, yeah. Piece one, right side up, covering the section. Stitch the piece two placing line, which means it's gonna sew a line here that you're that's gonna be your placement line for the next blue fabric. So I'm gonna go do this and, and do that placement line. Maybe I'll put in something that's a little bit easier for you to see. Michelle? Yes. You didn't go all the way to the very tip of the... Uh... Because it's the bottom. We're doing the okay. bottom one, not the top one. Gotcha. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and I think I'm gonna put the green back on mainly because I think you'll be able to see it, but you still won't see it when I'm done. So that way you'll be able to see what's gonna sew. All right, so I love taking advantage of every opportunity that I can to show you how to use your machine. So. Um, if you have a Solaris or a Luminaire, I want you to turn on your projector. Oops, I guess you can't do it while they're, well, that wasn't, didn't come out as planned. Let's mm -hmm. see. All right, so I can use my top camera. Notice where the starting point is. It's down here. We're doing the bottom one, not the top one. So that is another way that you can see that which one that you're doing. So how I did that was I was hoping to just uh, turn on the projector, but once you've started stitching, you can't use the projector. So if you look down here, you'll see that on your screen, you'll see that crosshair. But if you touch your camera right up here, your foot has to be down. So put your presser foot down. It's going to show you exactly where it's going to stitch. So that just kind of double affirms that you're going to be sewing on the bottom. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stitch.
oh, you know what? Was I supposed to place my fabric first? Because it kind of looks like I should have. Let me look. Let me look on the five by seven. Stitch the place two. Trim the fabric. This doesn't, no, I didn't put my fabric up high enough. I put it in the right place, but it's not up high enough. Let me get my, let me get my unstitcher, ladies. So this is my line that it's going to place on to flip and fold over. It might work out okay because it's going to be in this area here, but it looks like I should have put my fabric up closer. And since there was a couple of times that I did not put my fabric in the right place as I was learning how to do this, somehow it seems like it's really easier to just piece than it is to do it in the hoop like this, but. Pull that off of there. Use my eraser to pull those off of there. All right. I'm going to start by putting my fabric closer to the bottom because I know I'm going to end up trimming there. And then I'm going to back up. So I'm going to do my needle plus minus and move it up one because I need to re redo the one I just did here. Okay. Now I'm cooking with the X. All right. Trim the fabric along the upper edge close to that, that line. So I'm going to fold this back and I'm going to trim it close to that line. Might have to take this out of off the machine to do it. Don't think I can do it in there. All right. And then place piece two fabric right side down centered along this stitch line. So you wanna have an equal amount on either side. This doesn't really have a right or a wrong side. But this is the placement line. So we want to make sure that what's the placement line, you have an equal amounts on either side of the placement line. So if the placement line stops here and here, you're looking to get that in the center. So that's the center. Then we want equal amounts on either side. And I have my iron turned on and ready to go because I am going to want to press this. So now it's going to tap that line now. Okay, I'm going to take it over to my ironing um, area. I'm going to press flat. I'm going to use my finger to get it nice and flat there and give it some more heat. And then I'm going to let it cool underneath my little clapper, which is going to give me a really, really tight, uh, sharp fold line there. You can see how razor sharp that edge is. All right, back for the next step. All right, so the next step, it's a, a well, the last one we did was flip and press. So stitch the piece three trimming placement line, which is looks like it's going there. If I look on my screen, I can see the crosshairs there. If I turn my camera on, I can see 
um, where it's going to start stitching. Well, let me put the foot down. Where? Why are you not doing that? There we go. I had to turn it on so I can see where it's going to start stitching. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing with this. I'm gonna center it. First, I've got to trim, because you only get one chance to get that stuff out of there. All right, so right here, I'm just gonna go kind of at a little angle. And this, right on the stitching line. Make sure I'm in the middle. I'm just bringing it over to the ironing board to press. Hey, Lori, can you grab me another one of these kits? My kit seems to be short, two pieces of blue here. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, yeah. They just have two pieces of blue in here. They should have had um, green in those. I don't know. Mm -hmm. not, not trying to blame anybody, but I'm just saying. Oh, no, it's not. It's neat. It's the light pink. Okay. Yeah, it's just me. Okay. This goes to a different color. Okay. I'm like, oh no, what happened to my blue? I thought it was blue the whole way, but it isn't. We have some blue ones and some pink ones. All right. So I'm just pressing um, and I've got my clapper on top of it just so that I can get all of that and get a nice flat. It's just gonna look better when you have your points too, because you'll have a sharper, you'll have a sharper crease. All right, this is where we're at so far. Trim fabric along the upper edge, place the piece three fabric down, stitch the seam, flip and press piece three right side up. Stitch the piece four placement line. So mark. We are right here. Step 14, color stop 14, and it's going to sew across. Michelle, do your blue pieces go cover the upper left corner and the upper? We're going to trim them off. We're trimming them off. They only need to fit like this. Anything above that is going to get trimmed off. So now we're going to actually trim it for the placement of our next one. So this is what it should look like now. Hard to see, but here's the rest of it above it. So it looks like it covers it, but it's going to get cut off. Okay. Yeah. So the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually press this because this is a placement line for my orange. And if I leave my orange and do it that way, I'm going to see a shadow through with the blue. In a project like this, where you're going to do piecing, you do not want to add SF 101 to any piece that you have to flip fold and add more pieces to because by the time you get to the end, it's gonna be a bulletproof vest. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna press this and then I'm gonna uh, pull these back and I'm gonna trim um, right along the placement line. Press, press, press. You cannot press enough when you're doing piecing in the hoop. 
if you took the pineapple crossbody bag class with me, you know that you can't press it up when you uh, have all of those seams that are intersecting. All right, so I'll move you over here so you can see what I'm doing. I just gave that a press. Now I'm gonna fold this back and I'm gonna trim this away. And it's gonna expose the rest of my little piecing area. And if you want to, it's up to you. If you want to, you can loosen some of these threads and trim out some of this other fabric that's back there because the other peach piece is going to cover that. And you'll get that excess out of there. So I'm just going to try to get it as clean as I can in there. And then I'm going to grab some tape so I can get the... the nibs, the schnibble frizz. All right, so now I'm ready to place my other orange piece. Again, make sure that you have equal amounts on either side, and then the next one is going to be the tack down line for this. And then we're gonna repeat. I'm gonna press, I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna press again, and then I'm gonna put my clapper on it to let it cool. All right. I don't know if you can see how flat that gets it when you press. So I still have my very first clapper that I bought when I was in high school, when I was doing garment construction. Um, and now I have about four or five other ones, just of various lengths and sizes. Um, it's They're just really nice in a lot of situations. If you're waiting for like glue to dry on something, you can put a piece of parchment paper, or wax paper over the top of it and press down with the, you know, with the clapper. I use it. I do use them a lot. All right. So what's going to go next? Let me look at the directions. All right. So the next thing, let's see where we're at. We're on number 16. So stitch the piece five trimming placement line and trim the fabric close to the stitching line. So this is our three fabric. And see, it didn't matter that I actually used green thread because you can't see it. But look at how sharp that point is in there. That is a pretty point. And that comes from a press. All right, so I have to fold this back and trim it.
And then remember um, to center it. Even though you don't think you need to, go ahead and center it anyway. All right, back to the mat. All right, back to this machine. Last one. In this crazy origami embroidery here. All right. So this is gonna be the placement line means that I have to fold my fabric and trim it. So I'm not gonna trim this, don't trim this, just trim this. Because if I trim this, I'm not gonna have a nice point there. It doesn't, the placement line doesn't intersect with this piece. It gets trimmed after. All right, so I'm placing this, making sure that I have it centered. We've made it this far. It'd be a shame to make a mistake now. All right, so I'm going to go back to the ironing board and I'm going to press and flip and press and then use the clapper. All right. All right. Last one or the uh, step 20 is gonna actually sew the bo a box around that we're gonna trim around. So um, let's just talk about this for a moment beforehand. Right here is an open edge that would be easy for the machine foot to catch. So when you get close to that edge, stop. You have a really fun feature on your machines. Most all of them, you can press and hold and it'll go slow until you let it go. So that means as you approach places like that where you're unsure if your needle's gonna clear it or not, or if it's gonna grab it and you know flip it up or see there, look what I did, I didn't stop. And it did kind of grab it, but it only grabbed it the second time it went around. So 
It's like one stitch and I'm fine. But um, that's where you can utilize that feature. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and trim all the way around. And then the wash away topping is gonna go over this piece block and tape it in place. So let me go take this over and trim it. It's kind of hard to do it all the way around on the hoop like that, on the machine like that. And I do tape wash away topping because otherwise sometimes it just decides to have a, thank you. Um, otherwise it sometimes has a life of its own. And so it'll try to move when you're stitching and you're like, oh, then you have a wrinkled piece of topping on the top, which doesn't help. It just gets stuck in the, in the satin stitching. All right. If you want to start trimming a few stitches on the back, you can do that. I just kind of nip them a little bit. I'll tell you one of my favorite tricks though for this is I actually will hold a cigarette lighter a little bit of a distance away from it and polyester thread will singe right up. You just have to pay attention every minute. Singeing it seals the thread. Um, standing there watching it for too long kind of burns all back to your project. But um, if you have something like this, that's got a lot of um, little nubs, then you can always use a trick like that to kind of get rid of some of those. All right, let me grab my topper. Don't want this little guy going anywhere but where he's supposed to. All right. All right, so let me look and see what color I'm gonna do on my, what color did I, oh, I've used the dark blue. I guess I could use the dark blue again, or you can use whatever color you want. So wash away topper is one of those things that everybody should have a supply of is in their um, stabilizer collection. And there are things to look for when you look for um, wash away, you know, clear topper like this. Um, it should be easy to remove, meaning that it tears cleanly from what you've stitched it on top of. I found that out the hard way during the pandemic because I ran out of, of topper and nobody was open. Um, so I actually just ordered something off of Amazon. And um, since I didn't know what any of them were, I'd never heard of any of those brands. 
um, I went ahead and just picked one and it was awful. It was awful, awful, awful. I ended up throwing the roll away. It was awful because I do a lot of lettering. I love fonts. I'm font crazy. And if I have some topper that when I go to peel it away from my letters, it shreds and leaves little tiny things I have to pick off with tweezers all the way through. I'm not going to use it anymore. I want something that tears cleanly. So that's kind of what you're looking for as, as a nice quality in a, in a topper is when you tear it away, it comes off cleanly. You know, for if it's a name, you pull up and you pull forward and you should just be left when you get done. You should only be left with topper in like the middle of the E's and the A's and the P's and the Q's. Um, everything else should come off. So um, I was um, I was sadly disappointed and I was very, very grateful when everybody else opened up again so you, I could get some of my favorite ones. But um, I anything that has a satin stitch like this, I usually put a topper on it. If um, if I were doing the butterfly in a different situation, the one that we just did with the width of that satin stitch, this one's like almost a quarter of an inch wide. I would definitely have a topper. Why? because it keeps the satin stitch from sinking into the fibers of the fabric. It doesn't matter if it's a poofy fabric or not. I mean, I, I obviously you'd likely, likely reach for topper if you were doing a towel or if you were doing like poly uh, fleece, you know, some fleece or minky or something like that, because it's lofty and you know that you want to have your stitching stay on the top. But even cotton fabrics, even cotton like this, I mean, I would have put, um, I would put the topper on anything that, you know, anything that has got a satin stitch to it, including the the, um, the lettering at the top. I just think it looks better longer. All right, so let me pull my topper off and I'll show you what I'm talking about with easy to remove. Of course, this isn't much of a challenge because it's a square, but easy to remove means that I should be able to just pull back this way and tear. Pull back this way and tear. See how it just comes away cleanly? It's not leaving little threads sticking out there. And I should be able to catch this corner in here and have it all come up in one piece. That's a topper that you want <laughs> because it's easy to clean it off afterwards. Isn't that part of the whole process as well? All right, so the next thing up is going to be our flowers and leaves. So right now, Right now we're doing the stems of the flowers. Please have your um, please have your vanish bobbin, the bobbin thread that's wash away. Please have that handy. We're going to be using that next for you know part of the flowers. So um, please have that handy, but also please have it labeled. You don't want to be like me and have a very sad episode where when you washed it, it all came out uh, because I grabbed the wrong bobbins. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna do the um, the stems of the leaves first. I have a pale green for that.
All right, grab your water soluble bobbin thread. We are on color stop number 23, which is the smaller pink flower. And then it's going to go right into doing color stop, you know, the next flower. So you're going to be leaving your water soluble bobbin thread in for the next two steps. 
You can see we have um, this one's labeled at home. I have mine like this, where I have the, the spool of thread and the bobbins in a baggie and they're clearly labeled after that little mishap that was not much fun. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that bobbin out. And then I'm gonna change out my thread. So I have a really light kind of peachy color and a medium peachy color. All right, here we go. Michelle, did you put in the light peach or the dark peach? I put in the light peach. It's a small flower. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. They're your flowers, either one. If you swap them out, that looks good. That'll be fine, too. All right, so now um, I'm going to switch to the larger peach one. So this is the, the finish. So we just got done doing this one, and now we're moving to this one. But if you swap your colors out, nobody's going to know the difference. So in other words, put the opposite of whatever you put the first one, just put the other one on now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And when you get done, if you're ahead of me, when you get done sewing this flower, you need to stop and take your bobbin thread out and change it back to your regular bobbin thread.
All right. Don't forget, you have to take out your bobbin thread now and put the regular bobbin thread back in. So I'm going to do that. Don't, don't leave your vanish in. And I am going to put this right back into the bag. Oops, the wrong one in. All right, so let me grab my instructions and let's look at what we're doing next. It kind of looks like we are doing um, the center of the flower here, the larger flower, and the top row of the the decorative stitches. Let's look. See, I would probably do, um, I would probably put a topper on the decorative stitches too. Don't forget, change your bobbin thread back to the regular. So it's, um, I'm going to use light blue. That's going to be the center of my flower and the um, the top of the decorative stitches. You can use whatever color you want.
All right, now we're sewing the pink center of this flower and the pink decorative stitch. Michelle, I have a question. Yes. I'm doing Save the Date Pillows by Kimberbell, and I just had used some of my own fabric, but I noticed it kind of puckered. They were using a stabilizer, and I wasn't too sure if that was that so kind of a Was that using flex, uh, the flex form? Yeah, I haven't I done them. So if you're using flex form, Flexform is pretty stiff stabilizer. So if it calls for something stiff like that and you didn't have it, then yes, the amount of stitching on it would pucker. It wasn't bad, but uh, and then I bought the whole year from uh, A1. Uh-huh. And I don't want to ruin this step. I would say look at the directions and see what stabilizer they're using. And if it says like flex form or something like that, it's a pretty heavyweight stabilizer. So um, I would definitely um, try to mimic that, not just traditional stabilizer. Yeah, I think I used the heavier stuff. It was pretty stiff. All right, so our next one, we're jumping around here a lot. We're gonna do the heart next, the chenille heart. So I know a lot of you have Design Center and IQ Designer on your machines. You know, you can create chenille. You can do this. It's lines. That's it, ladies. It's just lines. So when you see how this sews out, the basis of chenille is you have a base fabric. All right. That fabric is stitched all the way around. That's your base. And then you have three more pieces of fabric that go over the top of it that are not stitched to the base with rows of lines in between them. When you cut between the rows of lines, it makes those three pieces that are not attached to the original piece, it makes them start to sh shred. You know, just shred, uh, you know, and actually flannel shreds some like amazingly. So think about that. I mean, when you, the I, to me, the idea of having a project like this should actually say, oh, hey, I wonder if I could do this or I wonder if I could do that. You know, like Christmas time's coming up. Not soon, but when it starts to come up, how about Noel letters in Christmas fabrics done with chenille? All you have to do is bring that letter in into Design Center, add those lines that you're going to cut in between and put three layers, more, three additional layers. So um, the first step here, which is step 27, Color stop 27 is to sew the placement line um, for the heart. So think about this while we're doing this. So all the pretty stitching around the outside edges of the heart, that's done on the base fabric. It would not be any different if you created something yourself. All right. So the more, uh, the thinner the fabric, the more, um, the more cottony the fabric, I guess, is the a good word. Other than, you know, flannel tends to shred pretty well as uh, as well. Ideally, it's going to give you the best chenille look because it's going to kind of fluff up. 
All right, so I'm gonna put that down first, set these aside, the other three layers, set them aside for now. And what we're gonna do is we are going to place piece one fabric right side up, covering the section, stitch piece, whoops, I'm on the wrong ones. Let me jump ahead to where we're at. I was on the wrong page. Um, stitch the heart placement line, I already did that. Place one piece of heart fabric right side up covering the placement line and stitch the heart tack down and then trim the fabric. That's our base. So nothing would change. If you wanted to do it with a letter, if you wanted to do it with a different shape. Um, I've seen people do these with panel quilts where they bought like, think about the Hoffman panel that's really popular right now. What if you wanted to do something different with that? All right, if you had four Hoffman panels, there's no reason why you couldn't chenille that Hoffman panel. Because it's cotton, right? One, one part becomes your base. The other ones become your layers. All right. I'm going to go ahead and trim this. Now, if I were to do that with a Hoffman panel, I would... Um, Obviously, I wouldn't have it on a piece of hard stabilizer because I'd want it to still be soft when it was done. But I would, where I'm sewing this to this fabric now, I would be stitching that base panel to a piece of oversized batting because that would be the inside of my quilt, right? If I wanted to do that. So if you want to make a quilt out of it, all the pieces have to be quadrupled. If you just wanted to do something fun to chenille it, you could use four of the panels or four of any panels. I've seen some people do some pretty cool stuff. Some people can be you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to basically do the finishing stitch on the outside of this heart. So um, let me see if I can grab the sample and bring it up and show you uh, maybe a little closer of a look. All right, so you can kind of see my lines of stitching there. But if I push this up, this is the stuff that the three layers that didn't get tacked down. There's the, the heart that we're working on right now, right here. So our finishing stitch is gonna go around that heart because we don't we want that to stay in place. All right, so still have the red thread. All right, now we're going to place the um, the other pieces. We're going to do a basting line. If you look at your screen, it's just the shape of the heart. So we want to baste this stuff down. Please use a color you can see because we're going to want to be able to remove this. So I'm going to switch to the peachy color. And then I'm going to stack all three of my left other pieces of fabric. over the top. You can tape it down or hold it. It's up to you. It's not that big of a piece. So you should be able to hold it. I want to be able to see this, um, this to be able to remove it. So I'm going to this bright orangey pink. It's a basting stitch. It's going to be removed. So I want to be able to see it. That's the important part. All right, this is one of my Michelle tricks, and this is up to you. I hate the fact that I get this big old wad of knots when I'm trying to baste something down. 
in most all embroidery designs, the first five stitches are the ones that are going to knot on the back. So because this is a basting stitch and I want to be able to pull it out without having to undo the knot, I'm going to move ahead five stitches. And you'll notice your needle probably went, your foot probably went back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. That's your, the, um, that's the tie off. I want to eliminate that. So now I, I'm just going to go around. I could have even gone a couple more. So now when I go to, re, to remove those basting stitches, I don't have to worry too much about having one knot that just tied on top of that first big knot. All right. I'm going to go ahead and switch back now to my red. How pretty is something like this? Would this be like on some of the Christmas stuff that you all do? Maybe just think of something in a different way. All right, just gonna sew the, the lines now. Notice it's a triple, it's a triple stitch. So that would be something, and again, easy to do in Design Center because you have a triple stitch in Design Center as one of your choices, or IQ Designer, if that's your model. So this looks like about three eighths of an inch in between stripes. So for mine, I use the, like I said, I use the chenille color cutter today for this. I'm just going to use a, um, you know, a, a seam ripper, but with the chenille cutter, it has a different widths on, it has four sides essentially with a different width, width of like a little finger that goes underneath there and grabs the fabric. And the reason for that is that you can grab the layers that are loose but it won't grab your bottom layer that's actually tacked down. All right. So next, um, using a seam ripper, remove the heart basting and with fine tip scissors, um, do the, the chenille. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this over and show you how this works. All right. Okay, first I'm gonna start by removing, by trimming all the way around. Because you don't wanna to have to trim after you've removed the basting. I right, see so you can see begin to see my my decorated stitches underneath there that are my bottom heart. All right, I'm gonna start from the back and I'm gonna go remove those knots. And I can see them because they're pink. Okay. 
Now I can say that that thing is probably about this is small. Remember I snag, I snag one from the back, but I think that's kind of small. Yes. Exactly. See why you want to be able to see it? Kind of hard to do if you can't see it. Does he have some other things that are what was it going to be? Oh, well, then heck, we could probably wait. He ordered the he ordered on lunch today. Okay, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay, oh. Let me do it. All right, we've got one left, one stitch left over here. All right, so this is already shredded. It's uh, it's not sewn there. So I'm literally going to use the ball side of my seam ripper because that way it makes it harder for me to grab what's underneath. I want to leave the base fabric alone. I can use my seam ripper so I can see that I can see my base there. I use my seam ripper. I can use a pair of scissors. So when you open it up, the other piece underneath is still there. I don't think I got them all. I think there's another layer there. Yep. That should be all of them. Is that all of them? That's all of them. And you cut. Is that? Yep, that's all of it. So the chenille brush is kind of a metal brush, but all the, you can do it with this as well. It just takes longer. The metal chenille brush works really well. But going back and forth and back and forth with the rubber tip will do it as well. And the more you rub, the more raveled it gets and the more chenille fluffy it looks. I needed a yeah. And then and let me get my tape. So I use tape more to get lint off of the, the embroidery than I do to actually tape things down. And it just rolled away from me. I really do not like chenille. You don't? You don't like no. it because it's messy or you don't like what it looks like? I don't like it because it's messy. Yeah. I have to tell you that I feel that same way about Minky. And I see a project that's got Minky in it and I just cringe. My husband yeah. laughs because if I have to put Minky on the back of a, a baby quilt or something, he has to get everything off of his workbench in the garage because that's where I'm going to lay it out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cover the workbench. I'm going to lay it out there. Just, you know, yep. some things are just shreddy. Yep. 
I but agree. it looks so pretty. Look at how pretty it looks. Yeah, I know, but it, to me, it doesn't. So, but it is, yours looks great. Mine looks terrible. So, why does yours look terrible? I just Do don't have... like the way it comes out. So. You don't even have to do Chenille if you don't want it. I give you permission. You can skip it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I don't think, you know, no joy, yeah. no makey. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's my motto. No joy, yep. no makey. There you go. My husband still has pants that have no hem in them because he doesn't get it. All right. So the next thing that we're going to do, which is color stop number 32 is to stitch the red work sewing machine detail. So I've got um, the red on from the chenille. So I'm gonna just go ahead and continue with that. Excuse me. All right, we got the spool of thread on the top that's got to sew, and then the little curly cues of thread. So this is probably another design, given its size. This is probably another design, since it's line work or red work, that could easily be done with 60 weight thread or even um, 80 weight thread. It would just yeah. give you more definition. Because if I look at some of the detail in here, there's beautiful detail in there that I might see better if the thread the thread wasn't so thick. All right. The next thing I'm going to do, um, I can tell you what our color stops are now, 33, 34, and 35. So 33 is going to be this line in here of the decorative stitches. 34 is going to be this in here, and 35 is going to be our lettering. So I did a dark blue on the original. 
And I just feel like this was kind of light. This was kind of light. This was kind of light. And I felt like the dark blue just stands out. So you do whatever you want. I'm going to use a little bit lighter color for that this time, I think. And I think I might still do a blue. Or maybe I will use... Um, what am I doing? I still have pink. I have pink. And I have peach. And I have the blue. Here's my peach. And I think I'm going to go ahead and use this screen that I used on the butterfly wings. Because I think it'll be more complimentary than having that really dark blue that kind of stood out. Okay. We are almost there. All right, I'm going to show you another little trick that's built into a lot of your machines. All right, you stay where you are. Um, I'm going to actually go back to the beginning. I didn't show this in the beginning because all of us were here, weren't were here. So um, I wanted to wait until more of us were around. All right. So one of the things most of your machines have is this stitch um simulator and when you get to the sewing screen all you have is the bar at the top but there's another place if i um do i don't get it there so you don't get it when you're in sewing but if i select return and i select the the hoop up here i have a stitch simulator and you might say when would i ever use a stitch simulator well, um, I'm sorry, the arm is just being really finicky today. Um, I mentioned in the beginning where so, when some of you weren't here that one of the things I really disliked about my project <laughs> was that the use of 40 weight thread was too heavy for the size of this stitching. And I wanted to, in this one, I wanted to use traditional 40 weight thread for this and for the body here but I want to have the opportunity to switch out and use 80 weight thread and an 80 weight bobbin for my small lettering because that way I'll see my small lettering better but right now I don't know um, I don't know how this stitches out I don't know if it goes from here to here 
to here to here to here. I mean, I don't know where it goes. So I have to know where it goes because I have to know when to stop the machine to change the color. So what I want to do is I want to go and I'm going to go fast to go through most of it. I want to go through it till I get to the lettering. Let's make it a little slower. All right. Now I'm at the lettering. All right. And I'm going to slow it down to the slowest. I want to see how it sews. So there's the bug body. That's good. And there's the chenille, right? The little, the little letters. And then the little letters, which is good. And then it's going to do the big heavy here. So what I know now that I didn't know before is that I can start out with the 40 weight thread because that's the bug body. Then I can switch out to what I want to do, which is on my own, is have a lighter weight thread here for the small lettering. And I know when it finishes the applique here, I'm going to stop and go back to my 40 weight thread. So that's the only thing I was looking for. So when you get an, a feature and you say, God, I don't know when I would ever use a stitch simulator. Here's a reason why you would, if you want to do something that's out of the ordinary. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go embroidery. And now see if I can just, boop, there we go. All right, so I know that it's going to start with the bug body. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my heavier weight, um, 40 weight, my traditional 40 weight. bobbin thread or 40 weight um, sewing thread. I'm going to leave my uh, regular bobbin thread in there and I'm going to get my other stuff ready. And I think you'll see the difference when, we, when this gets done stitching of why I did it. I know some of you out there are as picky as I am. So when I can, when I can, um, you know, cater to your picky, um, then I feel like I've done all of us a service because I, I want to know how to make it be more what I want and less what I don't want. So I'm going to use the regular um, dark gray. And I know because I use the stitch simulator, I know that when I hear it cut, when it's done sewing the middle of the bug, I'm going to stop the machine and change out my thread and my bobbin. As soon as I hear the cut, I press the green button because I know that's going to stop the machine for me. All right. So why am I changing out? If I had 60 weight thread in the gray color, I would have used the 60 weight in the gray and not changed out my bottom bobbin. But we didn't have 60 weight in the gray. We only had the 80 weight, which means that in that situation, my bobbin thread would be heavier than my top thread. So you know that the 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 real the reason that your bobbin thread should be lighter than your top thread is it pulls your top thread to the back so that you don't see bobbins thread poking through. So if I do the opposite here, I'm going to end up having white showing through because my top thread is lighter. All right.
All right, let's put them side by side. First of all, I'm going to, I I can see where I might want to trim on this when I, I might want to trim a little, a few snips. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I will get the rest of this afterwards. I just want to get a few of them. Look at the difference. Look at how clean that is compared to. It's almost like the lettering is a different size. So this one down here is really hard to clean because everything's all muddied together. This one up here, really easy to clean because it's not muddy, it's thin. So I will go in there and, you know, pick the, and, and trim those little jumps out. Um, but overall, it's definitely better than what we had, what I had before. That trick. So I'm going to go ahead and let it run for the rest of these letters. Oh, I forgot to let it do the eye, the top, the dot of the eye. So 60 or 80 weight thread for small letters. You'll love it. What I needed was my nippers with the hook on them.
As much as I don't like the chenille flowers, I do like the fringe flowers. Yeah, they I are love fun. The way they come out. I do yes. love fringe. Yeah, and fringe they come is out fun. great. Yep. Sadly, that is not something I can recreate in Design Center or IQ Designer. I can in software, but I always like to try to find things that you can actually do if you don't have software, you know? So, but yeah, it is. I do love the fringe. Fringe is just fun. All right. So I've got the last thing there left to do, and it doesn't really matter. I'm going to leave my bobbin thread in uh, my... my um, 60 weight and I'm just going to put my regular thread back on and if I had a piece of topper I'd probably use it on this but I don't but I won't all right so um I'm gonna show this is one of my little favorite sewing room um notions and it what it is is what you think it is it's a makeup sponge and it's just a really cheap one. I get a bunch of them in a package at the Dollar Tree for like a buck and, buck and a quarter. But I use this for actually wetting to be able to wet in places around. Because we're going to wet the back of this to dissolve the vanish thread. And um, it just works out better than spraying it. Because spraying it seems to get it wet all over the place. You can kind of control where the water goes with the sponge. So that's how I'm going to do mine is with a sponge and some water. It's also at, um, you know, if I'm doing something that's on wash away stabilizer and I do a pretty good job of trimming, but I just have a little bit left to go around the outside edges. That's the way I do that as well. Is um, I just get my sponge wet. I go around the edges a couple of times. I use really hot water. I go around the edges and they're done, you know, without getting the whole project soaking wet.
Finally, yay. All right, let's bring this over here and get this done. So um, I am gonna show you how to get it in the hoop first for those of you that don't wanna hang <clears throat> while I get the thing wet. So we're gonna trim the stabilizer, but leave it behind here. And I'm gonna turn my iron on so I can kind of press in a couple of areas. Leave it behind, just trim it to the, to the basting line, to the where it basted it onto your fabric. So we're gonna leave that there. All right. <clears throat> so the the uh this part is the front. This part is the back. So what I did is I actually lined the edges up from the back and then popped it into the front that way. Because that allowed me to keep close to that basting line. It wasn't perfect because guess what? The hoop's a little bit bigger. So I did still end up having to take out basting stitches. But that kind of gives you an idea now. Um, on the the um, the fringe, I'm going to go grab some hot water. Uh, yeah, I could be Donna. Yeah, you can touch the screen. Yes, the screen is like your um, the screen. Touching the screen while your machine is embroidery is like your um, emergency button. <laughs> so if it's doing something, then you can just touch the screen and that way you don't have to, you know, find the button. But the press and hold on the start stop button keeps it going really slow until you let go of it. When you let go of it, not all models have it, but most all of the brother baby lock models have it all the way down the line. If you press and hold it, it'll start stitching. This is an embroidery. Um, obviously, if you press and hold it when you're, you know, it's not going to work when you're doing sewing, using the sewing mode, just the embroidery side. But um, yeah, if you press and hold, it uh, prevents the machine from taking off. So I'm going to grab some hot water. All right, so the other thing you'll read sometimes is that you can um, is that you can snip that thread. But if you look at this, I really don't have much of the, the vanish thread that's showing. And if I snip any of that and I'm not and I can't see exactly what I'm snipping, then there's a really good possibility that I'm gonna cut something that I don't want to cut. So I'm just gonna take my sponge and dip it in the water. It's gonna get all fat and fluffy. And then I'm just gonna pat just right where I want it to go. I can't think that it would. And, all and you may not get all of it, What you know, I, if I don't want to wet the whole project, then I might go at this at a couple of different tries. And you know what? I might let it dry in between. Project one, 
but I don't, I honestly don't know. And then if you want to see if it's working, then gently, again, I use the end of my seam ripper. I can kind of start moving it and seeing if any of them are popping up. And you can see that some of them are. But all of that vanish thread has to be gone before all of the fringe comes up. See, look at that. Starting to pop up. So obviously I need a little bit more in there because if you look, what you want is all of the vanish gone so that the whole petal, if you want to call it a petal, the whole loop comes up. And I think I can get a lot of this up without making this any wetter than I have. <clears throat> mm. Little tiny bit of water. Look at, I'm going to take it out of the hoop for this so I can put it back in afterwards. Apparently, I didn't get the orange one as wet because this one's looking pretty good. Have you guys noticed that designer that's on Etsy, um, Artiply, <laughs> that's doing the fringe chickens and stuff? If you like fringe, you should check her out. It's spelled Artiply, A-A-R-T-I-P-L-I. -A -A -I -I, and she's on Etsy, but she does like fringe chickens and fringe everything. The fringe chickens are pretty cute. Not that I'm, you know, enamored that much with chickens, but they are pretty cute. I like to eat them. Look at that. I'm almost done. And I really didn't have to get the whole thing soaking wet. Yeah, if you, Donna, if um if you like um if you like fringe, she does some really fun stuff with fringe. She's it's kind of different. It's what I look for. I look for different. Most of us, I'm gonna guess right here today, most of us have been doing this long enough that we just um we're not as easily impressed as we were when we first started. We want something that's a little bit different. Sometimes we want something that challenges us a little bit, huh? Come on. There we go. All right. So there's my fringe. So fun. I love fringe. Now I'm going to, I've got my iron heated up. I'm actually going to press this a little bit from the back and I am going to pull out the rest of this basting stitch because I can see the line regardless. And my hoop that I'm putting it in is actually bigger than this basting line. So I'm never going to get it in the right place. Um, anyway. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, almost there. Iron's still heating up anyway. All right. 
You can see I'm pressing pretty hard and then I'm going to go over it. And Michelle, you're using no steam, right? Nope, no steam. Turned off. I have to turn it off too because I have a, a finger that automatically goes towards the steam nozzle thing. You can, I, I can, usually I can do this with my heat press as well. It's one of those things. The heat press has actually come in handy for a lot of things besides what I actually bought it for. <laughs> All right. So look at that. Most everything, I have to fluff my chenille back up now because I squashed it all down, but my my fringe is looking good. Everything else is looking good. The little pucker that was over here by his wing is gone. And um, I think I need to just trim that and I'm good. So let's get that. I will do between the letters, but again, I just want to put this up against the first one that I did. So the up close, you can really see the difference. I want, I haven't trimmed out my jumps yet, but I want you to focus on decorative stitches. Here's decorative stitches as it was done with 40 weight. Here's decorative stitches done with the 80 weight. I mean, you can really read it a lot better. So if you do stuff that has small stitching on it, it's probably a good idea. Um, to use a, you know, lettering that you do a lot, like uh, monogramming, personalizing, things like that. If you've got a lot of stuff that you do, it's probably going to be better if you use a uh, 60 or 80 weight thread for your lettering. You're going to like it a lot better. Okay, put that in there now. And there we go. Oops. And there we go. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you had a great time. Um, I will be putting this, uh, this video up on our YouTube playlist under Digital Dealer 2024. If you go to A1 Vacuum and Sewing's web, um, YouTube page, and once you get to our YouTube page, there's playlists there. You can click on the playlist. You can see all of them. And also we have a 2024 Digital Dealer Facebook group that we also post this video into. So, um, and I will send you the link to join that group if you're not in it already. Let me check the questions. Thank you, thank you. Glad Thanks, everybody you. enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank Great. you so much. And I will see you again. Um, I think Jeannie's doing it next month, but I'll see you again soon in another class. Yeah. Okay. Bye, bye, ladies. On Monday. Yes, you will. I have several of you in my class on Monday. We're going to yeah. have a great time. I'm ready. Good. So am I. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.